Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Layer, the show about 3D printing and our place at Slant 3D inside the industry. Today, we're going to be talking about Extra 3D, Humanoid Robotics, a really fast 3D printed building, and a couple of notes on hustle culture. But before getting into that, just a word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Audible. If you love books but can't find the time to read, Audible is your go-to solution. With thousands of audiobooks and podcasts, you can listen to your favorite stories anywhere, anytime. And here's the best part, by using our special link down in the bio, you can get an exclusive 30-day free trial plus one free audiobook credit and two credits if you already have Prime. So why wait? Give Audible a listen today. Now let's go on with the podcast. It's so moving into news. First section of the day. Um, there is actually a lot of news uh, this week. Uh, there's everything from, I think every company had an announcement of some sort this week, guys, to such a degree that we can't really cover any of these stories. The other part of it is each one of these new stories is more of like a company announcement that was then picked up. So I am dubious to call it news. It's not really insightful or useful. It's a presentation. So Extra 3D did a thing. HP introduced a new material. There was a building printed in Europe in 140 hours, which is Europe's biggest 3D printed building. Uh, Massivit did a thing um, and partnered up with somebody. And Stratasys has uh, acquired a company to uh, expand a number of their technologies and that kind of thing. But again, all of those are like corporate announcements. We bought a thing. We partnered with them. We got a new product. We did the stuff. Also, by the way, we got a new product too. But the this topic for a little later. But the the news in general this week was not terribly exciting. Uh, the most interesting news that I wanted to share was the fact that the Figure Humanoid Robot, which is, if you're not familiar, Figure is a company making a walking, moving, humanoid, human frame robot. And their robot, uh, their company, is currently valued at $2.6 billion because last week they announced that they had raised about $600 million. I think it was $636 million in order to develop Figure further. And for context, Figure is effectively a competitor to the Tesla Optimus robot. That's the whole backstory. I was watching a number of their release and review videos, as well as uh, stalking them just lightly, you know, like you do. Uh, and I saw that their figure in the upper shoulder had a, I'm going to say, sensor package that was FDM 3D printed. Figure, if you're out there and you're watching... If you need help scaling up, we're available. We might even, even though you just made a bunch of money, we might even cut you a deal. If you are out there and need some FDM printed parts to make like the first hundred or thousand of your bots, if you're ready to start scaling up production of those things, there's no reason to go to molds. You don't need molds. You guys want to iterate quickly. This is a hardware project. You want to have as much flexibility in it as possible as you evolve the design of the robot. You need a large scale printing partner who's able to produce parts that you are able to prototype in house, but then scale up as you need more. And then you're able to move on from there. So do reach out. If you need to contact us, we have a quoting form on the website. But Figure has uh, FDM printed parts inside of the robot, which is not unsurprising. And it, it's, it's surprising, quite frankly, that you don't see it more often. Everybody always has these beautifully machined parts and that kind of thing, but they are expensive and difficult to produce. And Figure is very clearly iterating very quickly. And of, they're not the most scrappy of the startups out there that I've seen of the the humanoid robots, which I, I watch fairly closely because that is my industry in a past life. Robotics is where I came from. I keep tabs on it, especially right now, because the other side, interesting side note, which quite frankly is more interesting than the 3D printing news. Uh, last month with the figure deal and a number of other ones, they were like, somebody mentioned that like the robotics industry had raised about $500 million in that month which is bananas because the robotics industry has never raised billions of dollars in a year, let alone a half a billion dollars in a month. And now it's going to a single company, effectively, because, yeah, figure got $500 million. But there's been this weird transition with AI and all the demos going around about it to where there's just exceptionally refined training on all of this stuff. So there's a lot of excitement, from my perspective, absolutely, too, that there's a... There, there's a shift 
number one, a shift in perception from the industry as a whole of what can be done with robotics and how hard it would be. And um, the, actually having products that are compelling. These walking robots, these manipulating robots that are not needing to be exhaustively programmed to do a very simple thing is really exciting, but unrelated to 3D printing. And I apologize for that. That's small tangent, but it's really cool. And they have a 3D printed part in the bot. Again, we're available. Reach out to us. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Uh, that's pretty much all there is for news. There's not that much. Yeah, big building was printed. That was the coolest thing that had happened. It was printed pretty darn fast, which is how, how uh, I didn't get the mark on how big the building was, but this biggest 3D printed building in Europe to print it in 140 hours, which is uh, about six days. Um, yes, about six days is impressive and tough to do. Uh, so good for them. Very good for them. Because uh, putting down concrete that quickly and not having it all just slop into a mess is one of the big challenges of 3D printed buildings. The the creation of materials that could be printed reliably was actually tough. Interesting side note, 3D printed buildings did not come up recently. 3D printed buildings have been around since about the 1930s, 40s. Uh, if you Google it, and or heck, if you want to stream through my LinkedIn back three years or something like that, you will see a video of a 3D printer that has a guy with a bucket dumping concrete in the top of it, and it's basically like this little circle thing laying down concrete in a spiral loop and printing a building. Um, they just didn't use a digital process. They just had a cylinder, and they printed like a grain silo. So it's not a new idea. Uh, the innovation that has come from the printed houses lately is in the material to where you can print concrete in kind of a refined way with the digital process so that you can do layout pretty well. Those are the innovations that we've contributed with modern tech, but it's been around for a while. Okay, moving on to the next thing. Got that. Oh, product announcements. Uh, tangled filament. We are supposed to get the parts in for the extruder next week. So that we should be able to get all of the 4kg spools caught up and get back rolling with production and start getting scaling up. Uh, and again, like we discussed last week, we're working on getting another extruder, so we should be able to start going even faster on Tangled alone. So all, all of this machinery is dedicated to pretty much exclusively Tangled. So there's that. That will be coming down. Also, this, this show will be coming out on Sunday. Stay tuned. Because on Monday, we have a pretty large product announcement. We will be um, scaling up and releasing a new version of a software that I think a lot of people will really like. It's been, it's really neat. It's really cool. The team has done a really great job. And that is gonna, I think it's going to help out a whole bunch of people to be able to scale up their farms in really useful ways. So we have a bunch of cool software announcements coming over the next week or two. And the first one will be tomorrow. So be looking for that, and there will be more details tomorrow. But really cool thing. Okay, topic of the day, the discussion topic, hustle culture. Ah, I am a very bad practicer. Here, okay, um, here's the background of this, and this is why this came up. I recently, um, I had a friend whose daughter was doing a report for her senior project on hustle culture, um, quote unquote hustle culture. The reason she is doing the report on hustle culture is because her father, my friend, uh, has spent the last 10 years or yeah, about 10 years building a very successful company. And she and I were in the building at the same time in two in the morning when I was starting uh, Slant 3D and he was working on his company, which was a couple of years older than us. So she has felt the side effects of extreme work ethic. And he is not allowed to be her, her mentor or source around this topic. So he said, go talk to Gabe. And she came to me. And it, it was an interesting conversation because the first thing I asked her was, what was the definition of hustle culture? And a hustle culture is defined... I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the longer forms of this, but effectively toxic work to where you work so hard but effectively gain nothing and you just end up burning yourself out. 
but there's two different components of this. There's 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 extreme work ethic, which is typically I would say someone who is it's very often contained in founders because extreme work ethic allows you to gain more. And then there is a for an employee it is it can turn into toxic work more readily because you're not necessarily in control of the results yourself as much as like a founder is. A found if I make 10 more sales calls, it directly impacts the the progress of the company. Whereas if an employee make, works for 10 more hours, it doesn't necessarily result in a raise or something along those lines, depending on the company that you're in. And I was thinking about this and I was like, why the, the, the concern, I, I looked at a resource or, or sources in the report that she was writing about this and they discussed the idea of like putting in tons and tons of work and not getting a result out of it, not getting a raise, not raising your standard of living, not having the business be successful, those types of things. And I, I just had pause to why I, how this could be defined because I, I do not think anyone out there would reasonably say that not working hard is a key to success. It's not. A person who works harder than someone else has a higher probability of being successful than somebody who doesn't work as hard. But the caveat to this and the nuance that I think gets lost in this conversation of hustle culture, should you just work 80 hours a week? No. If you are working really, really hard, you have to ensure that your work is creating a result. The way extreme work turns into a debilitating time sucker is if you're not measuring the result of your work. So if you go and you work 60 hours in a week, did you get 30% more done than having worked 40 hours a week? If you didn't, you wasted your time. And, th and that, th that's just the reality of it. More hours in doesn't necessarily create higher quality, better work, or even proportional work. This is especially true in the situation of like losing sleep. I never recommend to anybody to lose sleep. You have to remain at a, a level of performance. I'm, I'm going to stay away from that one for just a minute here I'm, while I'm focusing on the hours of work. Hard work is necessary. But as you do it, you have to evaluate, I put in more effort, did I get a commensurate return from it? The way of defining these returns, and this is the, the more ephemeral part of it, is number one, speak with your manager and say, hey, boss, I am going to put in 20 more hours this week so that this project is done 20 hours sooner than it would have been. For that, I want to know is if, do I get a gold star? Do I get a bonus? Do I get a raise? Is there remuneration for this extra work? Um, so if you're in a typical corporate bureaucracy or something like that, that is what is necessary. You need to talk to your boss and say, what is the path for me to gain success? And if I put in more hours, does that path compress? Like, okay, I get promoted when I hit that milestone. So if I hit that milestone sooner by working more hours, then I get promoted sooner. That's the thing. Have a core measurement and a main goal that you're shooting for so that as you put in more hours, you're like, I got closer to that goal today. Therefore, I, it was worth the extra time. I'm accelerating what I can do by just putting in more time. Everybody else is going home after 40 hours. I'm going to work 60. I'm going to get promoted 30% faster. And my boss knows that as soon as I hit that milestone, that uh, uh, promotion kicks in. That's the thing to do. Work with your manager, work with your boss to get that promotion. If you're running a company, you have to look at it uh, from a prioritization kind of a thing. Does this work and these extra hours create a meaningful impact to the company or a, a useful result? Or am I just doing busy work? It's very easy in the operation of a company, if you're the founder or starting a new business, 
to get into a swirl of busy work where you're like, we're behind on everything. Uh, here, here's an example. Like here at Slant 3D, uh, if we have like a large project going through, uh, me as a manager, I can see, oh, we're not processing the parts fast enough. As a founder, I think I'm going to go help. I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to go help them. But as a manager and as an evaluator of the use of my time, it would be more useful for me to go make the calls to hire a temp agency or bring in somebody else or that kind of thing so that that work still gets done, but I am still available to then go make more calls. Because no one else in the company can hire somebody. That's my final decision. So I have to put my time there. If I go help process the parts, that's fine. But tomorrow, when there's twice as many parts again and my physical labor can't help at all, it would be stupid of me to help out today when tomorrow we're going to be behind, when today I could have just let it, could have hired somebody new, and then tomorrow we can get caught up. So that that's the type of like thought process from like a founder or business operator's perspective. The the evaluation of is this effective use of time? Not can I work harder and put in more hours to get there? That all being said, if you are a founder, you have to put in a ton of hours. No one has ever done anything significant or world changing. No one has ever done anything world changing with a typical nine to five if you're trying to start a business. You can't. You're not allowed. Stuff happens. You have to respond to it. Um, and you that insecurity is always present. But if you're in the typical kind of a corporate position or within an organization and that kind of stuff, or like if you're a member of our team, if you're somebody on our team watching this podcast, the, the thing you should do is talk to your manager, um, whoever they may be, and set up the milestones so that more work equals more results. The culture of hard work, if your boss just says, rah, hoorah, we got to work hard and that kind of stuff, and you're either not paid enough, not excited enough about what you're doing or anything else like that, again, have a conversation with the manager or get a different job because that is that gets into the toxic thing to where you just got a task manager and you're not bought into it. So like if you're – Working at McDonald's and your manager's like, make hamburgers faster. Well, if you're not slacking off, that might be an unreasonable request. Um, if you're actually trying hard and doing your best and that kind of stuff, it is on the manager to then adjust and make an allowance for your capabilities. But so long as you're not slacking off. But. Anyhow, it, it depends on the context. The main thing is measure your time. Um, that's the best I have on that. That's the, the only way I've had of defining that is that the, the way to avoid toxic work and busy work is to make sure that you're measuring it. That way it's not this ephemeral thing of I have to work harder and something magical will happen. It's... I put in more time, and that meaningfully created a bigger result. If it doesn't, don't put in more time. It's not useful time. Go spend time with your kids or something because um, that's, that's way tougher to get a hold of. So that's pretty much that. Um, that's the show, guys. This is going to be a little bit of a quicker one, so we're not going to go doing a, too big of a deep dive on that kind of thing. So not a huge amount of news, not a whole lot of product announcements. We'll be coming back around. But if in the context of toxic work, it's uh, about midnight that this is being filmed. So I'm going to sign off and we'll, we'll get this out here tomorrow morning. So have a great day, everybody. Have an awesome one. Like and subscribe and comment down below any other topics that you'd like to see in the future. See you all later.